Hey, thanks for joining us at Revolution Church, where we're starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. If you ever have any questions, would like to support this ministry financially, or just want more details, simply go online to revyourlife.com. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We would love to stay connected with you throughout your week with the Rev app. It's free and available to download from wherever you get your apps from. We hope you enjoy today's message. Good morning, church. How you doing? Hey, I woke up with a scripture on my mind this morning. Isaiah chapter 40 says, Do you not know, have you not heard, that the Lord is the everlasting God, creator of the heavens and the earth? It's because of him that we will never be the same. Amen. Can you make some noise for God one more time? Hey, do me a favor. Hug somebody. High five somebody. And you get to say Merry Christmas because it's December. Just go with it. Go with it. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. I said Merry Christmas to somebody that walked out of the last service as they're heading to their car and they said, oh, will I not see you for a few weeks? I was like, it's December, bro. You can start saying it. It's that time of year. Hey, we got a lot of people watching online. We want to welcome Oats up in snowy Minnesota. Thanks for being with us, Oates. Robin in Shiner, Texas. Ooh, I've been there. Okay, Jason Brown, he's in the military, uh, back from deployment in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Jason, we're pumped about you being home. We're pumped about that. And last, Nancy, who was in the hospital this week, and she's at home, able to join us, even though she's recuperating and resting. Nancy, we're praying for you. Hope that you heal up quick and that you're right back here with us at church. Let's give it up real quick for everybody online. And let's say our mission together because it's all about the mission here. It's all about Jesus and the command that he gave us to go into the world and be his voice, to leave his mark, to wash feet like he washed feet, to serve, right? Here's the mission. Would you say it with me? To start a revolution of grace in one life at a time. That's what we do here at Revolution Church each and every day, not just on the weekend, but all week long. And I'm pumped up you're here. We're going to kick something off brand new called the Christmas table. You see, I got my Christmas table up here today. All right. The Christmas table. And what I want to do is just kind of have a conversation about Christmas that will hopefully, um, for anyone who needs it, and even for those who, who think they don't, kind of wake the wonder back up of Christmas. Okay. In fact, that's what I'm calling today. Wake up the wonder. Would you say it with me? Wake up the wonder. That's what I want to help you do all month long, and here's where I'm getting this from. Um, My wife and I have been married 17 years, and as long as I've known her, she's been one of those Christmas freaks. Where you're like, you're just a little annoying about it, but I know you're right and I'm wrong. Y'all know the kind of person I'm talking about? You love them, but at the same time, you're like, back off a little bit. She's always been one of those people with Christmas, but I've always known she's onto something that maybe I wasn't onto, and just a few years ago, God really kind of woke the wonder of Christmas back up for me. And so I've been planning this for quite a while, and I'm excited to hopefully help you do the same. And I want to center the conversation on the idea of the family table. You know, it's amazing if you study the family table in our culture today, what has happened over the last 40 or 50 years. Um, Years ago, families would sit down and have a meal together. On average, they would take 90 minutes. 90, y'all. Nine zero. Some of you are all like, what did they do for 90 minutes? <laughs> 90 minutes. Families used to sit down at the table, have a conversation, look at each other, talk about life and their days. Maybe if they were a Christian family, even talk about maybe what God was teaching them. 90 minutes. You know what it is today? Today, the average is 12 minutes if they actually ever sit down. Not only that, but it's, it's happening later in the day. Families used to sit down at about 5.30 and do this together. Now, because of all the extracurricular activities and because of how late people stay at work, it's on average 8 p.m. that people sit down. And I would argue that the family table years ago was replaced by the family television. And we stopped sitting across from each other, talking to each other, engaging with each other, and started sitting, staring at a screen. Wom, 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 right? I don't know why it's my TV impersonation, but it is. (laughs) And I would argue that today we're seeing another shift 
Maybe we're back at the table or back in the same room, but now we're staring at little bitty screens with Facebook or work or text messages. And listen, don't throw up some big wall. I'm not trying to get you to be Amish this Christmas. Okay, so just settle down. Like, that's, that's not the goal, okay? But I do think that we are losing something precious. I do think that something very important has been lost. And I think that it's hurting us. I read some research this week about the family table and how they have now proven that families who sit at the family table together at least five nights a week, okay, this is the research that I read, those families see kids who excel in school. Is that, is that not amazing? And it's not because they're sitting there doing homework while they talk, all right? It's just because they're spending time together and the right kind of environment is being fostered in that family. They are also linking time at the family dinner table to lower obesity rates in children. How amazing is that? that one's like backwards thinking, right? You would think, no, the longer they sit there at the table and eat, the bigger they're going to get. No, it's actually the opposite, right? And so many other health benefits, physiological benefits, mental benefits. You know, I would say in a way the table is meant to be kind of the heart of the home. And I love that idea because I think it's a great metaphor for God's family. You know, Christmas at the end of the day is a story about a family. It's a story about how you and I and anyone you'll ever lock eyes with has a seat at God's table. How God did whatever it took. I mean, that's the Christmas story. God doing every single thing necessary for you to have a seat at his family table. Now, we lost it in the Garden of Eden. But if you go back to before we lost it, it's amazing. Adam and Eve had daily time with God physically. They walked with uh, physically looking at God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And ever since then, God's been trying to put that back together. He did it in Jesus. The, the, the first Christmas story announcement, most people think it's Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 2. No. The, the first Christmas announcement is Genesis chapter 3, where God makes a promise to crush the head of the serpent and give us our seat at the table back. That's the first Christmas announcement. Now, I love the picture of the table, and since day one in our church, we have used the table as a metaphor for our church, to help us stay focused on who we are as believers and, and what we're called to do as Christ followers. And we've always seen it that we've got three chairs at our table, three seats, three categories or kinds of people. Now, I'm going to use some labels here in a second. Don't let the labels bother you. It's just to help us think, okay? I'm not trying to put some label on anyone or anything like that. At the same time, though, I think that as we have this conversation about the table, you're going to see that you've got a seat. And you're probably going to even be able to, to kind of identify with one of these three seats. Now, here's the cool thing about our table called Revolution Church. We serve up a beautiful biblical meal every single week. That's right. See, the Bible self-defines as spiritual meat, the protein, okay? Spiritual meat. So we serve up the spiritual meat, God's word, every week. Jesus said that he is the bread of life. So that's what we serve up. That's our big, beautiful, balanced, biblical meal that we serve every single weekend here, every single day here. Jesus, the bread of life, God's word, the spiritual protein, the meat. Who do we serve it to? Three chairs. Find yourself in one of these chairs. Chair number one. I call this the seeker. The seeker. I'm talking about somebody who is spiritually curious. Maybe they know a little bit about God, but they're just not ready to go all in yet. I'm talking about the person who's figuring out this God thing. I'm talking about the person, if I walked to your seat right now and asked if you were a Christian, you'd not be able to honestly say, yes, absolutely. There'd be some hesitation. There'd be some uncertainty. Listen, if this is you, we are so pumped that you're here. And we have always had a seat for you in the church. Always. But you know why? Because Jesus always had a seat. For someone like you at his table. And we've just decided to model our table after his. We don't just accept you. It's not just like a bothersome, well, since God says love people, I guess you can come and sit over there. No. We're enthusiastic about you. We are pumped that you're here. So much of what we do is with you in mind. 
This is why our church has a value that we call guilt-free, graceful. This is a guilt-free, graceful church. You can come no matter who you are. In fact, what we like to say is everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect, and anything's possible with God. This is that kind of church. We stake everything on grace alone. Grace, that which is unmerited and unlimited in our lives. Amen? We realize it doesn't ride on us and how good we are. It all rides on what Jesus has already done. One of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible is 2 Corinthians 5.21, which says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. We hope that that speaks to your heart today. And we hope that you keep coming and, and checking out the God thing. And we hope that you process and that you get your questions answered as much as you can. But we also know that there's an element of uncertainty that will always be there. And so can I just tell you, if you would say, yeah, that's me all day long, that's me. I am in that seeker chair. And maybe you'd even say, I'm grateful for a church that lets me be there. Hey, again, we're just pumped you're here. Can we just show them, church? We are pumped you're here. Pumped you're here. But listen, seeker chair people, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you a little secret. We're pumped you're here. We don't want you to stay here in this chair. We want you to move to the next chair. Oh, you have an agenda. See, I knew it. Churches always have an agenda. Absolutely. We have to. Because Jesus has an agenda for you. Jesus has a plan for you. He has something amazing for you. So we have to. And we create this place for you and set it all up with you, with you in mind as, as we set the table to serve up this beautiful biblical meal. But we always do it with the idea that you're going to take a step. And that you're going to switch chairs because you're going to give your life to Jesus Christ. And it's when you do that that you move from chair number one, seeker, to chair number two, I call it beginner. The beginner. Now, I can't give you some amount of time. How long are you in the beginner chair? Is it one year? Is it when you hit your one-year Jesus-following birthday that you move chairs, Pastor? I can't. It's different for everybody. Okay? And I know people who have stayed in this seat for, for a couple years, and I know people who have been following Jesus for decades that are still in this seat. Okay? We all move at a different speed. And really, I would say there's only one determining factor that can kind of show you when you switch seats and to the next one, and I'll, I'll show you that here in a second. See, this first seat switch is pretty obvious. You gave your life to Jesus. Boom. Now you're not a non-believer. You are a brand new believer. Make sense? Yep. You are a beginner. And beginners, there is so much that we could encourage you with and say today. We could spend months and months. In fact, in, in a way, every single weekend, we gear everything towards you. So we think about all three chairs. Not just one, but all three. But one of the biggest things I want to say to you today, if you consider yourself kind of a beginner, and, and hey, can we all admit that in some area we're still a beginner? That in some areas we still struggle spiritually? Can we be that honest, please? That in some ways we all, we all got a cheek in this chair. <laughs> can we put it that way? But beginners, here's what I want to say to you. You are not alone. Right. See, one of the biggest lies that I see our spiritual enemy, Satan, throw into the face of brand new believers that they'll buy into. And so often, you know, move slower or maybe even fall away from the faith. It's this idea that they're all alone. And so they'll think things like this. Nobody cares. Look around the room. This is a church, you're only at one of five services, I'll remind you of that, but this is a church of thousands of people who aren't perfect, but care. Right. Right. We do care. And we are here. We, okay, not the pastor. See, if you thought the whole church is all about the pastor, you got the whole wrong idea of church, okay? I thought the church was about Jesus. Right. This is not about me. It is about Jesus and his people, his family. We are in this together, right. all of us. So look around the room. Look around right now. Take a look around. Look behind you. Look next to you. Smile at somebody. Awkward. I don't know that guy. Just smile. <laughs> the people you're looking at right now, these are the people that prove to you you don't have to do life alone. Right. So we want you to know you're not alone, okay? Have you read Proverbs? I think it's Proverbs 27. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Jesus in the book of Matthew, where two or three are gathered, I am there with them in their midst. We are never alone. We have each other. We're designed to do this 
together. But I, but I also want to help you understand another idea when I say you're not alone. See, I also see the devil tell people, especially beginning believers, you're the only one addicted to pornography. And then they think they're alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. You're the only one who can't get their finances together. You are the only one who was a bonehead and said something like that. No one else in the, these are church people. They would never say that. No, no, no. Look around the room again. Here's what you're going to see. People who struggle. Amen? Just like you. Just like you. You're not alone. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do this in isolation, okay? But also, you're not alone in the fact that you struggle. Every one of us does. We call this being heart and soul. We try to be a heart and soul church. A church that sticks together, a church that is here for each other. We, we have chosen to do life together. We have chosen that isolation is not an option. That we're meant to live in community. Seeker, move into the beginner. What's next? What's next? I call this chair the reacher. The reacher. I would say this is a more mature ing believer. I would not say mature because I don't want anyone to be like, oh, I am so mature. <laughs> okay. No, we're all still in process. Like I said, we all still in some ways got a cheek in that chair. Okay. But we are maturing. And I told you I had one little thing that I think is really kind of the determining factor if you look through scripture and especially the life of Jesus that tells you if you have really switched from beginner to reacher chair. And the answer is in the name. Are you a reacher? A reacher. Do you care about looking across the table at the person who's still a seeker, who's still uncertain of the God thing? Do you care about the fact that they are not going to be in heaven if we don't reach them? Or have you turned your back? Are you disconcerned with the person far from God? Because see, the way that I read the Bible, Christian is what we are. We are Christians, which means little Christ. All right? What are we supposed to do ultimately? Be After we give our life to Jesus, be Christ-like, right? Well, then what was Christ like? I'll tell you what he was like. He was a person who reclined at his table with those people and those people and these people. Right. And you know what? Even if they weren't like him, they liked him. Right. Even the ones over there who, who were partying like crazy at the club last night, backing that thing up, whatever it is. <laughs> even that person. And Jesus spent most of his time with these kinds of people. He went to the party at Zacchaeus' house. He chilled with Matthew and his homies. Some of the worst of the worst of their day. And then when the disciples got focused on something other than people far from God, Jesus said, hey, 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 wake up. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You guys are supposed to develop into reachers. You want to be spiritually mature? Are you a reacher? Followers fish, period. That's what he said. So if, you, if you're wondering, well, I'm not sure if I'm in that reacher chair. I just, it's, it's as simple as, do you have a heart? for what Jesus had a heart for. Because when you fall in love with somebody like you fall in love with Jesus, you're supposed to start to love the things that they love, right? And what Jesus loved most was seeing somebody's life completely turned around. I mean, and he didn't give this as an option, by the way. He gave it as a commandment. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go, therefore, into all the world. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, even until the very end. And it's so cool if you go study the word go right there. It wasn't an optional thing. He wasn't saying, hey, Patrick, uh, if you feel like going, you can, but if not, it's okay. <laughs> hey, Miranda, if you're fit... There's no option if you go study the original language. It is go, period, now. It's urgent. Get out there. Be a reacher. We call this being found people who find people. We've decided that we are addicted to life change. That's a good thing to be addicted to. <laughs> that when someone comes up out of that water after getting baptized and they're going public with that inward decision and an outward display... Man, that's why we cheer. That's why we lose our minds. That's why we hold up signs and take pictures and video and show it to you and celebrate it. Because we are addicted 
to life change. We, we are most concerned with the thing that concerned Jesus the most. That's how you know if you've shifted over here. Now, here's what I want you to see. The church only continues to be built and God's kingdom only continues to grow if someone is actually mature enough to complete this circle and go out and reach more seekers. Do you see that? It's only if the church stops being a reacher that the church will stop, that the gospel will be shut down. And I don't know about you, but I am grateful for generations of Christians before me who maybe they didn't even know me, but they cared about me, my generation, reaching me, reaching you. I'm glad that they were focused enough to say, you know what, sometimes I'll even have to set aside my own personal preferences so that someone else can be reached. Amen. That sounds like a guy I know named Jesus. So that's our table. That's how we serve up the big, beautiful, biblical, balanced meal every week. This is our healthy, spiritual ecosystem. We actually want, we are very intentional about this, we want all three kinds of people in our church. I'd even say we try to go for having about a third of each of them in our church. Right. It's always interesting because like the worship team, they'll come and be like, oh, I just don't know, man, that service, like about a third of the people weren't really singing or raising their hand. And I'm like, yeah, they don't know Jesus. Right. That's like the whole goal. Now we're doing, we're doing it right. And they're like, and a third of them looked like they weren't really sure. And I'm like, yeah, those are the beginner believers. Awesome. And about a third of them were just losing their minds in worship. Yeah, those are like the, the reachers. See, we're doing it. Don't you love that? I love that. I love that. Now, our table right now looks a little different because it's Christmas, right? And how many of you have noticed the sights, the sounds, the smells? They're already changing because Christmas is here. When you go places, it's going to look different. When you drive by that neighbor's house who thinks he's Clark Griswold, there's going to be lights all over the place, right? Like... It's just a fun time of year, isn't it? But as beautiful as it is, Christmas will come alive for you in a whole new way if you will look at it in the light of the intentionality of God's plans and its implications in your life. And that's what I want to help you see. How many of you have ever been to an art gallery, like a legit art gallery? Okay, this would be less people, but how many of you have ever been before they turn the lights on that shine on the paintings? Anybody? It's, it's crazy. You go in and you see the painting before it's got light on it, and you're like, big whoop, right? But whenever they turn on those gallery, gallery lights, the painting comes to life. And it's, now you're like, I gotta get a loan from the bank because I'm gonna buy that painting. <laughs> look how, I don't even like paintings, but look how incredible that painting is. It's just the light that makes all the difference. The brilliance of the painting goes to a whole nother level when it's lit properly. And what I wanna do is help you light up Christmas this year, just like that. And so when I say Christmas painting, you would probably think of something kind of like this. There might be a couple wise men, some shepherds, maybe an angel. There's always a baby who's like a little brighter than the rest of the painting, a mom and a dad. I mean, the, the Christmas paintings are fun. Most of them, if you really look at them and really study it, they're really not even that historically accurate. But it, but it, it, it gives us the fuzzies, and that's what we think about, right? But what I want to tell you is there's so much more than just this scene. And what I want to help you do is, is stare at that all month long, but shine a little bit different light on it so that it comes alive, so that the wonder is woken back up. Look at the Christmas story, Matthew chapter 1. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, uh-oh, right? Like, this is the funny part, the comical part of the Christmas story, okay? And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, if you've ever read that part of the Christmas story and you're like, I thought they weren't married yet, like, and you get a little confused, it's because there was a cultural difference, okay? They actually treated engagement in such a serious way that you had to be divorced to break off an engagement. Like today, you just take your ring off and pow, never mind, throw it at them and you're done, right? If it's engagement, okay? It was different back then. You actually had to, to kind of get divorced from the engagement, okay? So that's what's going on here. And it says, verse 20, I love this. As he considered these things. Joseph is considering some stuff. Think about what Joseph must have been thinking about. I know the men in the room can totally identify with this, right? He loves Mary. He has for years. He's already promised to take her, her hand in matrimony, right? He has made a major commitment 
to provide for her and, and be so many things in her life and for her, right? And he doesn't want to disgrace her, but then he's torn because there's this other part of him thinking very clearly like, I know Mary's been with another man because this crazy talk about God did it, that just ain't happening. I ain't believing it, right? You know he had to be torn a little bit. So he's kind of considering these things. And then it says, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So I love that, because Joseph starts the story with this perspective, and the story ends, and he has a completely different perspective, right? And what I hope to do is help you see what Joseph saw and hear what Joseph heard and wake the wonder back up. So here's the painting we're going to paint of Christmas as we stare a little more intently maybe than we ever have before. Get your notes out. I'm going to give you all the points right now. We're going to do it kind of in a little formula. This is Christmas. God came down. Sinners are saved. Hurts are healed. And humans have hope. That is the Christmas story. Would you read it with me? God came down. Sinners are saved. Hurts are healed. Humans have hope. Would you read it with me like you're excited about Christmas? Because we're going to say this a lot through the month of December together, okay? Let's read it again. God came down. Sinners are saved. Hurts are healed. Humans have hope. Let's break it down. First, God came down. God came down. Think about how counterintuitive that is for you and me. See, in, in man's mind, uh, attaining greatness is all about reaching up. How high can I climb? How, how cool are the people that I can run with, right? What, what kind of status can I gain? That's man. For us, it's all about reaching up. The world's about reaching up for greatness. I would say even in religions, the solution is to reach up. To reach up and to, to climb and claw your way up to God. But see, in Christianity, we have a very different worldview. The premise in, in Christianity is that no matter how hard you claw and climb, you still fall short. Because God is simply too holy, too perfect, too incredible, too timeless, right? Too amazing. And so you try all you want, even on your best day, you fall short. Can we agree? This is where that idea comes from, that we're guilt-free, graceful, everybody's welcome, nobody's perfect. That comes from a wealth of scripture just about this idea that most religions say, okay, whatever the idea of God is, give commands, you keep commands, you raise yourself up, you, you become, you know, some religions say your own God, some say more like God, some say with God, but Christianity doesn't say any of that. Christianity says you can't ever do any of that. You can never bridge the gap on your own. You can never get to him on your own. So the only solution was what? God came down. We could never get there, so God left heaven and came to us. God in a baby bod. Don't you love that? God put on a human suit. God came to us. And that seems so simple, like, well, yeah, we all know that, Zach. Okay, move on in the sermon until you stop and you look at it a little longer and you allow yourself to realize and really grasp and under understand and just ascertain this idea that, wow, God came down. It's so opposite of what we would do on our own. It's so counterintuitive to, to every piece of our nature. Religion just says, do this and do this and do this and do this and you'll be okay. And, and Christianity says, no. God already did everything that had to be done. And all you have to do is accept that, right? That's Christmas, that God came down. That's why verse 23 said that... Uh, we shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means God with us, and it also means God for us. Don't you love that? God with us, God for us. See, God came down. He took on all the burdens of man. 
He took on every struggle, su subjected himself to all that, even the burden of sin. And now if we accept by faith who he is and what he did, we receive the free gift of salvation. He is God with us, not God out there somewhere a million miles away that we have to try to get to. He's God with us right here, right now. He's God with you in your car and in your workplace and in your family and even when you're exercising, right? He is God with you when you're alone and afraid. He's the God that never forsakes, the God that always provides comfort, the God that always gives wisdom. He's not the millions of miles away God. God came down. He's right here. God came down. God came down. Sinners are saved. Sinners are saved. If it doesn't wake you up that God came down, maybe this one will. God came down. Sinners are saved. In verse 21, the angel said, you shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, who is he going to save? His people. What is he going to save his people from? Their sins. Whose sins? I'm just getting you to think about the verse. Whose sins? His people's sins, right? Is that what that says? Okay. Wow. Wow. That means his people sin. That's what that means. His people sin. Sinners are saved. It doesn't say that saints are saved and have a seat at the table. It says sinners are saved. And that's good news. See, because we all have the propensity inside of us. It is in our nature to sin. We aspire to greatness, but we fall short. Over and over and over. We just have that in us. And, and if you don't believe it, turn on the news any day. And there'll be some new juicy story about one of our favorite human beings, celebrity, athlete, politician, whatever, astronaut, whatever, right? Local hero, whatever. Some juicy news story about how they, they won't call it sin, but that's what it will be about. How they fell short, how they blew it, how they got it wrong. And then we act shocked when we see someone behaving badly. Like, we are so shocked with it. But the headlines are filled with failures. This, this week, I had to go to HEB. Had to go to HEB. And um, I was at the checkout, and I was thinking about my talk this weekend, and I was thinking about how God came down, sinners are saved, and I was noticing the tabloid magazines, which I have never in my life opened, but I decided to grab one as I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, God, I hope nobody from church sees me right now. And I'm looking, <laughs> and on the cover are these juicy headlines about that celebrity's sin and that guy's sin and that woman's sin. And then I, I flipped it open a little and I was looking. I'm not, I'm not making this up. I found an article, huge headline, seven celebrities that sweat a lot. I was like, who buys this stuff? And I asked the lady, I was like, do a lot of people buy these? And she said, you would not believe how many people buy these. She said, you would not believe how many people, they, and they're like thumbing through them. They can't wait to see it. Even, I'm trying to like have a conversation with them. How are you today? As I'm boop, boop, boop. And they're just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're reading seven celebrities that sweat a lot. <laughs> Next page was this. Emmy winners who are frauds. Next page was this. Five celebrity men who left their older wife for a younger wife. And people are like, wah, wah, so shocked by it. Okay, why are we so quick to do that? Maybe it's that we're actually naive enough to think that we are not sinners in need of a Savior. Whether you go to church or not, like in our naivety, we assume, I think, sometimes we're something other than a sinner in need of a Savior. But we, we think we're something else. Hey, pinch yourself. Wake up. Apart from Jesus, there is zero hope. But God came down and sinners are saved. Does it still amaze you that you, 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 that you are saved by a God who loves you? Does it still amaze you that he saved you? That's the wonder of Christmas. And the second you forget that, or the second it doesn't amaze you anymore, I'm telling you, you have lost something. And kind of on a side note, why are Christians so surprised by sin? Why are we so surprised by it? Why are we so constantly shocked by it? 
I, I'm not surprised by the constant flow of sin that oozes out of all of us. I'm not surprised by it. Why? We're all sinners in need of the Savior. Every single one of us. Things only change when we accept that and we accept the way that he made for us. That's what Christmas is about. See, 700 years before there was a Bethlehem, the prophet Isaiah wrote this. He said, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, I love it, Wonderful, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God was intentional, church. He had a plan. It was called Christmas. Who's grateful for Christmas and what God did? God came down. Sinners are saved. But it's not just that. It's not just to get out of hell card. Also, hurts are healed. God came down. Sinners are saved. Hurts are healed. God came to also heal our hurts. He came also to give abundant life right here, right now. I'm talking about hurts. I'm talking about the place in your soul that is crushed because of a destructive pattern or habit. But let's not even talk about the stuff that's happened to you. Let's just talk today for a second about the stuff you've done to yourself. How many of you are like, I don't need any help messing my life up? I could do that just fine on my own, right? Stupid decisions, sinful patterns, destructive behavior, abusive relationship, whatever it is that we, we subject ourselves, God came to change that too. He came to heal those hurts too, right here, right now. Never get so comfortable that you miss the fact that God wants to continually pick you up, dust you off, wipe your tears away, and get you going in the right direction again and again and again, however many times it takes. Sinners are saved, but also hurts are healed. He wants you to be aware that you are a son, a daughter of the king of kings, that you have a seat at the table, that he already did all the work of, of preparing the table and preparing that it's pulled out. He's just waiting for you. Come take your seat. He's just waiting for you to, to sit at his table. And there was never a time where he wasn't waiting for you. There was never a time where he wasn't preparing it. You, you were never trash. Never. You're not trash now. You were never trash before. You've always been a child of God in spite of your sin, in spite of the junk, in, so, in spite of the failure, right? And he still wants to heal the hurts. He, he wants to give you your seat and just nudge you up and say, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you're home. I love this about our good God. And last, I want to ask the band to come and to tell you about how humans have hope. And we're going to talk about these things for the next several weeks together, but God came down, sinners are saved, hurts are healed. What does that all mean? What does it all equal for us? It means that humans have hope. We have this hope, Hebrews says, as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. But think about it. No Bethlehem, no hope. No baby, no hope, right? The baby changes everything. Without that baby, you have no hope. Without God coming down, you have no hope. Without that baby becoming a man and dying on a cross to save sinners, you and I have no hope. Without God coming and, and, and intervening in our lives and saying, now I am with you, we would never have a hurt that could be healed. And Christmas is the thing that changes everything. It's the thing that changes everything. And I'm hoping you don't miss that this year. I'm hoping you stare at it in a new light with more intensity than ever before. And the wonder of it could begin to wake back up for you. I hope it's not just a month of parties you got to go to and trees you got to decorate and smells you got to smell and places you got to be and presents you got to buy in the mall and blah, 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 blah. It will be those things. I'm just telling you in the middle of all of those things, there is a wonder <laughs> happening. That there is something special that we're celebrating, that God is doing. Are you a believer? If so, this is the time of year to celebrate. This is a time of year to let the light shine more brightly than ever before. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And I just want to pray for us for a minute. God, I pray that the wonder would wake back up for anyone who's lost it. That we would never forget who we are in Christ. God, thank you that you made a way. Thank you that you came down because we could never make it up there. We could never make it to you on our own. God, thank you that because of the fact that you came down, we are saved. Thank you. And thank you that our hurts can be healed. Thank you that we have hope. 
And if that all sounds like something you'd like to be a part of and you identified yourself when we started this whole thing as somebody sitting in that seeker chair and you'd say, that's me all day long, that's a chair I identify with, listen, we want to help you move chairs today. We want you to know, even in the middle of, of a sea of questions and uncertainties about God and even in the middle of, of hopeless things you're dealing with and, and, and hurts and, and all kinds of hangups, whatever it is, in the middle of all of it, I want to actually challenge you. You think you're so far from God, you're so much closer than you could possibly imagine because God came down. Sinners are saved. Every one of those hurts, he wants to heal. It is a process that can only start if you give him your life. And that's what moves chairs. Have you surrendered all to him? If not, why not? And why not today before you walk out of this place? If that's you, if there's any doubt in your mind, any uncertainty, we want to help you take that step. And it's as simple as telling God you're ready. He sees your heart. He knows it. Just pray something like this. You can say, God, I give you my life. Thank you that you came down and that I can be saved. And I want to solidify that right now by surrendering everything to you. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I declare that in my heart, with my mind, with my mouth. I repent. I turn from the old to the new, and I ask you, as I take this seat at your table to make me a brand new person, show me that I'm saved, God. Teach me. Heal my hurts. Help me to understand this hope that I now have. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give it up for anyone taking that step. Make some noise.